So first, I feel it. Um, I feel it responsible that as somebody who played NCAA football regularly and somebody who lived and died by that game and won multiple national championships and Heisman <laughs> trophies with the University of Alabama, Mr. O'Bannon, no hard feelings. We're okay. <laughs> We're, next, we're now going to move to the next portion of the program, which is uh, the panel. Many of you have been handed out note cards with pens with nice little basketballs on them. If you have any questions, please write them down. We're going to go up and down and collect them. As the uh, panel moves on, we have extra note cards. If you um, don't have any note cards or you have more than one question, please feel free to give us everything you have. And now I'd like to introduce our esteemed panel. We have Professor Aaron Bazuvis, who is a professor at Western New England School of Law. She's a noted Title IX expert and director of the Center for Gender and Sexual Studies at Western New England Law. Sexuality. Sexuality Studies. Sounds yeah. <laughs> we have Alan Milstein, who is a shareholder and chairman at Sherman Silverstein. He's a sought-after commentator on, commentator on sports law issues. He's been on many major news networks. And he led the team that represented Maurice Claret in his case against the NFL. We have Ms. Danita Peoples, who is the assistant athletic director at the University of New Hampshire. This is her first um, visit to the law school, by the way, so we're very excited to have her. She's attended and spoken at many events throughout the country on the issue of NCAA com compliance. And I think it's fair to say she's an expert at this point, given her position. I wouldn't call myself an expert. <laughs> we have Luke Bonner, who, as he pointed out, is not a lawyer, but we're going to welcome him anyway. He played college basketball at the University of Massachusetts and West Virginia University, then went on to play professional basketball. And he was a founding <coughs> member of the um, he was a founding member of a group uh, designed to represent college athletes in um, <coughs> college athletes across the country. And last but not least, we have Xavier Pope. He's the owner of a premier sports and entertainment law firm called the Pope Law Firm in Chicago. He's represented some of sports' biggest names, including former number one overall picks in the NBA draft. And as his <coughs> website points out, he is the best dressed man on TV. So. Uh, we're all, uh, we're all very excited to have every panelist that's up here. And now I'm going to turn it over to our um, moderator for this panel, uh, Adjunct Professor Michael Dew. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. The fact that Xavier is on the panel today, this morning as I was getting dressed, you know, normally this is a very easy endeavor, but I, I went through <laughs> shirt after shirt knowing that nothing would possibly be good enough, but, but I, hope, uh, I hope this passes muster. That's a pretty good shirt. Thank you, thank you. Um, so today we're... The tie's we're not too good, though. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> All right. Well, it's been a great panel, everybody. <laughs> so uh, that... that Thank, yeah, thank you, like Professor that. Roberts. Let's see your socks. <laughs> so we're, we're going to divide uh, today's panel discussion into a few different segments. We're, of course, first and foremost going to talk about how Ed O'Bannon, who is here in the room with us today, used the antitrust laws to take a stand in his historic case against the NCAA, and for that matter, the role that the antitrust laws have had in other high-profile litigations, including the Maurice Claret <coughs> litigation. Um, we'll talk about the Ninth Circuit's ultimate decision, as well as um, what Judge Wilkin did at the district court level, and really try to analyze that case uh, narrowly, and also antitrust law as a tool of reform more broadly. We'll then talk about another tool in the toolkit, which is unionization. We certainly have one of the country's um, experts in that regard in terms of unionizing athletes, uh, Luke Bonner, and both the possibilities and, frankly, limitations in attempting to unionize athletes under both federal and state law. And we'll certainly look at other ways in which institutions and athletes can take a stand. Certainly Judge Wilkin, in her district court opinion, mentioned that the antitrust laws might not be the only way that athletes can affect reform. She certainly mentioned the possibility of Congress taking action or the possibility of conferences in schools 
um, undertaking voluntary action, but, but certainly beyond that, some lawyers have pursued extremely creative strategies to affect change. Lawyers like the lawyers for Andy Oliver, who were, were able to use the rules of professional conduct in the state of Ohio to successfully challenge an NCAA bylaw regarding what agents could do in their representation of athletes. It's, of course, important to talk out about how things are going to play out, both legally and compliance-wise, in the event that, as Mr. O'Bannon predicts, and, and we hope comes to bear, uh, student-athletes are recognized as individuals who must be paid, or perhaps uh, who must be at least entitled to receive non-monetary compensation in excess of what they receive now. It's easy to talk about in theory, but we, we have to drill down and think about how that would actually play out in the event that, that reform uh, continues to occur. And of course, the whole way, we're going to make sure we get some perspective from the institution side of things. We have Ms. Peoples here from the university, um, though we won't limit her comments, uh, of course, the university side um, positions. I know that she has some strongly felt uh, personal feelings as well on the issue. And uh, we have Professor Bezuvis, um, who is going to be talking about um, the Title IX implications, really written a fantastic article, and talk about some of the Title IX and other gender equity implications of Mr. O'Bannon's case and the reform of intercollegiate athletics in general. So on the very first day of amateur sports law here at the law school, the very first thing that we talk about on the very first day is what is an amateur and what is a sport? Well, we'll put aside for, for a second the question of what is a sport. We'll assume that basketball and football certainly are. But the NCAA's constitution has a very interesting definition of amateur. It states that student athletes shall be, quote, amateurs in an intercollegiate sport and their participation shall be motivated primarily by education and by the physical, mental, and social benefits to be derived. So far, that accords with a fairly standard definition of amateurism that you might see in a textbook or a dictionary. But then the Constitution goes on to say, as Judge Wilkin points out in her district court opinion, that, quote, student participation in intercollegiate athletics is an avocation, and student athletes should be protected from exploitation by professional and commercial enterprises. So Mr. Pope, is the NCAA doing a good job of protecting student athletes from exploitation and commercialization in accordance with its constitution? That's a great question to get us started out. <coughs> I've talked about this a ton on television. I also talked about it a ton on Suda Podcast on XavierPope.com. Also my Twitter timeline, Xavier Pope. Absolutely not. Uh, the last sentence that you mentioned talked about being exploited. Ed said that, he, looking back, he felt like he was an employee. So that basically means at a tender age, guys are 18, 19, 20 years old. And in their mind, they're just balling. But to the minds of the institutions that supposedly they have this trust, based on the definition you gave, they do not. And so we see many institutions that are making millions of dollars. The Notre Dames of the world, who are their, they're on their own conference. The Dukes of the world, the Kentuckys of the world, making tons of money off the backs of players, mostly African-American players, who come from impoverished neighborhood, neighborhoods and look at going to college as a step to make money and risking their bodies in the process. That's a trust deficit that, quote unquote, student athletes gave away. <coughs> and as Ed O'Bannon has stated, that things have changed. You know, when the whole student athlete definition came along, it was about workers' comp. It was a fiction to prevent players from making money in terms of not even making money from getting money when they get hurt. And now it's evolved into this giant institution that has this, I call it a legal fiction. So absolutely not. Mr. Botter, did your awakening happen <laughs> after your collegiate career was over or was that something you, you felt during your time playing college basketball? Um, I mean, it was something I was exposed to at a very young age. Just a little background, I'm the youngest of of three children in my family. My brother is uh, Matt Bonner. Uh, he played at the University of Florida and I was in middle school when he was there. They were like number one in the country pretty much all four years there, sold out all those games and all that stuff. 
and uh, my sister actually played at Stanford University. Um, she was a classmate of Jason White, who actually led a, a lawsuit against uh, the NCAA. And uh, just some, some stuff was like happening even through their recruitment and through their experiences. My brother almost lost, uh, almost got suspended for a season um, for accepting, a, I, want, I want to say it was a Rotary <coughs> Club scholarship for being valedictorian of his high school. That goes to every valedictorian that uh, he wasn't allowed to do. Um, so, you know, my parents had to pick up overtime and all that and like pay that off for it to not be an issue. Um, and then by the time, you know, I got to college, um, where it really hit me was, uh, so I transferred universities, I went to West Virginia, we were uh, a point away from making the Final Four. And, you know, you come back from the games or missing class a lot, you come back from whatever round, and there's 20,000 people, 30,000 people waiting in the parking lot at the arena, you know, for us to get back from, from a game. And you're not a normal student at all, like in these situations, you're, you're different, everything is different. And then I transferred to, to UMass, and that was a whole kind of ordeal in terms of the restrictions in, in that and, you know, things that were said by the coaching staff to my family, you know, in, in, in my presence at a young age. This is high-stakes stuff for the coaches, for everyone. Um, and then, you know, my, going into my last year at UMass, we made an NIT run. We were a good team. We made an NIT run, and uh, my, my head coach, you know, left – uh, in April, you know, of that year, to go make $3 million a year with a $10 million buyout uh, to go be the head coach at Oklahoma State. Mm -hmm. And so I'm stuck with my last year with, like, a whole new coaching staff and all this. And it's just – that kind of just made me realize, like, like what? Like, this makes no sense um, in terms of the, the amount of money that other, other people are making, you know. And then I tear my MCL, and it's – my, my parents are making the copay on my MRIs and you know all that stuff. There's a lot of like very basic protections that that schools now like since I left even a lot more schools provide them, but it's still not a requirement. Like there's some very basic stuff. So that's what kind of like made me realize there's no one, there's no legitimate entity that is straight up, you know, representing the the best uh, interest of the players themselves. It's the NCAA that's doing that. But they're also responsible, not the NCAA, it's the NCAA, the member institutions and the administration, who are also the people that are in charge of, you know, generating revenue and kind of doing everything else. So I think there needs to be kind of a more of a checks and, a, and, and balance uh, in place. A union. A union, yeah. <laughs> I never would have imagined. Don't say that word. People aren't say players association. <laughs> Fair enough. But before we move on and look at the antitrust angle in the Obama Sorry. case, I would, no, no, please. <laughs> I, I wanted to get Miss People's take on on whether the NCAA is truly honoring its constitutional promise of. Um, you don't have to answer this if you don't want to, but whether it's um, honoring its constitutional promise of protecting student athletes from exploitation. That's a very loaded question. Fair. Um, <laughs> Let's just keep in mind that the NCAA is made up of member institutions. There would not be an association without the universities that are a part of it. Um, the student athletes have a group called SAC who vote on proposals. They bring their issues to the NCAA. So they, I, have, they have one person of 25 votes, and that only very recently happened, just for the record. <laughs> Get it, Luke. Thank you for Sorry. pointing Sorry. out that the record. I am not against you. <laughs> that, <laughs> that's first, a, let me just that's first, me first say, me first say <laughs> that. I, I see the issue on both sides of the fence. I am a compliance administrator. I know that I full-heartedly have my student-athletes best interest at hand. I also understand the difference between the Power Five conference and the mid-major um, institution that I am at. That does not go to say that the administrators at the Power Five level do not have their student athletes' best interests in hand. I think that it is very, very um, cumbersome, tedious, and, and difficult to completely um, protect student athletes from exploitation, which is a very strong you know, term to use in terms of um, student athlete experience. So, so to answer your question, I think that the intent there, I do not believe that there is any malicious intent by the member institutions that make up the NCAA. 
<coughs> are things falling through the cracks? Are there um, institutions that are making billions of dollars a year? Absolutely. The NCAA's main revenue source comes from basketball. So I understand and I see both sides of it to say that they're out to exploit. And again, this is the NCAA. Danita's <laughs> personal opinions are, di are somewhat different, but I, I just don't believe so. I wouldn't work within or affiliate it with an association that was maliciously out to um, exploit student mm -hmm. athletes. So let's, and I appreciate that answer, let's talk about some of the tools in the toolkit that student athletes have uh, both generally and as a result of some of the uh, pioneering work that student athletes and, and groups of student athletes have done. Um, Alan Milstein is a, um, probably much to your surprise, we've talked about how you never intended to become a antitrust litigator and you've been involved in many antitrust <laughs> cases. You know, could you explain briefly what antitrust and <laughs> what are you kidding me this is my this is my former associate who's doing that to me uh, the antitrust laws essentially are designed to protect consumers from anti-competitive uh, actions so how does it work with respect to maurice claret because one of the things the nfl argued in the case was there was no antitrust injury. There was no injury to competition. Uh, and what we argued was, Maurice Clair, this was what's called a monopsony as opposed to a monopoly. It was, it was a situation where the NFL controlled the labor force and Maurice Claret wanted to be uh, in the union. He wanted to be, he wanted to play football. And <clears throat> there were teams, we knew there were teams, that were ready to hire him and pay him a lot of money to carry a football and run over people. And w the reason this was a conspiracy, an antitrust conspiracy, is because for instance, Dallas Cowboys wanted to wanted to draft Maurice Claret, <clears throat> and they would have drafted Maurice Claret, but they couldn't because he was a certain age. But for the rule saying that you had to be three years removed from high school, they would have drafted him. And so the teams have to all get together and they say, "Look, we won't draft any player of that age if you don't draft any player of that age." That's why it's a conspiracy. Because it's it, otherwise everybody would be out for themselves, and as a result of that, there was uh, a damage to competition, which is damaged by people like damage to people like Maurice Claret, who wants to enter the labor force. So the purpose of the antitrust laws is basically to say that individual entities. Another thing the NFL argued was, hey, we're not an individual entity; we're one entity. And the NFL doesn't, the Cowboys don't compete against the Patriots. The Cowboys are part of the NFL and the NFL competes against Major League Baseball. That didn't, that didn't go over very well. <clears throat> and, you know, so essentially it is a, a group of companies that got together, made a deal, and the deal was essentially to uh, bar athletes from entering until they were a certain age which we argued was a conspiracy and an illegal conspiracy that violated the antitrust laws. And I think uh, Mr. Milstein explained perfectly a Section 1 claim under the Sherman Antitrust Act, the notion of a contract or combination or conspiracy and restraint of trade that had allegedly occurred in the Claret case. And, and Mr. O'Bannon's case as well was focused on Sherman Act violations. And as has been mentioned, the district court had certified a class that consisted of uh, all current and former student athletes who had played either Division I men's basketball or football ball subdivision football whose names, images, and likenesses uh, may have been included in certain game footage and certain video games. And Mr. O'Bannon had settled with EA Sports and left a sort of one-on-one -on -one situation, uh, as Professor McCann has put it in the past um, in some of his writing on this case, of, of Mr. O'Bannon versus uh, the NCAA. 
of course, there were other, other plaintiffs as well. But uh, his claims essentially were that, at the end of the day, that student athletes were entitled to receive full cost of attendance or COA scholarships, and student athletes were entitled to receive further compensation associated with the licensing of these name, image, and likeness, or nil, rights. So I, I want to go through with this panel the arguments that the NCAA made at the time of trial and see if you think that these hold water. And of course, I also want to talk with Professor Brazubis about some of the Title IX implications of, different, of the different aspects of the ruling. So the NCAA's main argument on appeal was that the antitrust laws didn't apply in the first place. And that was somewhat similar to the NFL's argument, one of the NFL's many arguments in the Claret case, that for various reasons, the antitrust laws, laws simply didn't apply. And the NCAA relied on dicta from a Supreme Court case called Board of Regents that said, quote, in order to preserve the character and quality of the product, athletes must not be paid, must be required to attend class, and the like. But the Ninth Circuit rejected that argument and held that the NCAA and its regulations and bylaws could certainly be subject to antitrust scrutiny. Uh, Xavier Pope, is that the right result? It's absolutely right. the right result. I mean, just on its face, just look at what the NCAA is. It's, uh, it's this member institution. It's getting together for play, for rules, and things of that nature. Um, and if they get together to make sure there is nil, <laughs> name, image, and likeness being paid for, then that absolutely goes to the heart of what antitrust is designed for. It's, it's, a lot of this stuff is so simple. We overcomplicate it. It's so basic. <laughs> fair, fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> so let, let's look. The NCAA, obviously, in its arguments and briefing, acknowledged that the Ninth Circuit might not accept that argument, and it didn't. So the NCAA attempted to advance a number of pro-competitive justifications for its conduct. And I'm sure Mr. Milstein is going to have something to say about these. I, I suspect Mr. Bonner might as well. So the NCAA <laughs> attempted to put on evidence that consumers preferred for college athletes to go essentially completely unpaid. Do you think that that's a valid pro-competitive justification for what the NCAA's amateurism bylaws mm. state? You know, it's the same argument that, that, uh, that the Olympic Committee made. Mm -hmm. You know, that people won't watch the Olympics if they're paid. Mm -hmm. When just the, just the, you know, people don't care. They, all, they want to do, all, all they want to do is see good athletes compete fairly. So. You know, but but would we want a situation where the where the college athletes, the college football players, or the basketball players are paid the way the NBA or the NFL players are, are paid? You know, I don't think so. I don't think we're ever going to get there, and I don't think you know because my issue was eligibility. I mean, if you're going to pay a college athlete a half a million dollars to play basketball, why shouldn't he be allowed to do that? in the professional leagues. Uh, you know, but my proposal instead is that all athletes, not just football, you know, I, the, the, prob the problem with, the, with the, the way the media has covered the O'Bannon case is it's always talked about as football and basketball. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot more sports in the NCAA than those. And there's a lot more, you know, you think of a wrestler who puts his body at risk. Now he's not making any money for the school, but he's getting a scholarship and he's working hard. You know, so m my view is that all athletes, whether they're wrestlers, whether they're women's uh, uh, field hockey players, should be paid an hourly wage, the same hourly wage that other student workers are paid. The people who are in the concession stand, the people who take the tickets, the people who work in the library, you know, they are all employees of the university and should be paid the way student workers are paid for the work they do outside of the classroom. All athletes matter. <laughs> um, I, I think this is a bogus argument. Uh, it's pretty basic as well. If you look at what college athletes get today, it's more than what they got you know, 30 years ago. And I'd argue that athletes are paid. It's just, it's a, you guys are lawyers, you'll know the actual terms, but it's like you know, an Ill illegally price fixed uh, you know, compensation package that you're getting as a college athlete. And, and, and there's already, you know, tremendous budgetary disparities between schools. So instead of just paying straight cash, you're seeing, you know, Alabama putting in a barber shop and all this crazy crap in their locker rooms as a way to, you know, 
compensate their athletes. And no one seems to care that Mike Krzyzewski makes, you know, however many million dollars a year versus the UNH head coach. And there's no issue in terms of compensation there. So why, when you talk about the athletes, is all, all of a sudden like you're concerned about people aren't going to watch the sport anymore. When it's more commercialized than ever, athletes get more than they did. And interest in the sports is the same as it ever has. I think ultimately that what the NCAA is going to run the risk on is you know, losing viewership because people nowadays are more aware of the exploitation going on. If you don't act on that, I think you're going to see a lot of people taking more issue with uh, you know supporting these sports, especially in something like football, where there's not even there's not even mandated rules on how many full contact practices you can have in season. That is crazy with all we know about CTE and mm -hmm. concussions and all that. Even the NFL adopted you know rules on that in a non CBA year. That's like the. That's you think what's people like, are going to stop watching because they they feel sorry that the athletes are exploited? I don't think so. I don't think so. No, I don't think I don't so. Think so. But. I don't. I don't. I don't think so. And I, but I do think that they deserve the right to negotiate for how much they get paid. Not just saying, "Hey, you get eight dollars an hour, nine dollars an hour," like the right. the graduate student working. That's they're not the same. This is a specialized talent, and this is America, dude. Like we pay people what they're worth in the market. But what what are they? worth you open a huge pandora's box when you're talking about let them open the at, box though but teams who are non-revenue <laughs> generating sports that are non-revenue generating versus teams that bring in the money so that the disparity is is large and what does that look like how much do you pay the golf player yeah. or the skier yeah. who nobody is going to watch or the rest well, well there, there's, versus, a, there's a racial the, component versus, to that too. versus the football player who is breaking down his body for two and a half hours? I think on that's Saturday. what the Title IX thing discussion. <laughs> yeah, I, I, so I let's bring you into the discussion. I'll, I'll do it. I'll Perfect do it. Segue, I'll take yeah. up. So, um, I mean, Xavier, you're right. This is America. We live in a country that honors capitalism and free markets. Um, and it's really tempting to go entirely into that paradigm after we've had this discussion that's all about how college athletes is behaving like a commercial entity. We're talking about its you know, uh, price fixing behavior and how competitive it, it is in certain markets um, and its profit motivation and its status as something that has arguable employees. That's all behavior that's associated with business and commercial enterprises. So of course it makes sense to take the next logical step, which is then the free market should control if athletes uh, are able to uh, sell their talent uh, and charge whatever the market will bear for that, that ought to be the solution to this problem. Um, that makes sense up to a point, and that point is this. Uh, college athletics is housed within the confines of educational institutions, and educational institutions, while they might also be these commercial running these commercial enterprises on the side, um, because of their status as educational institutions, they're subject to civil rights laws. And civil rights laws don't care about free markets. Civil rights laws don't say, uh, for good reason, right? Because if civil rights laws cared for free markets, then we wouldn't be able to tell a business that they have to be open to customers of all races when uh, the business could make an argument that, hey, if I just have a white-only clientele, I'll earn, a, you know, I'll have a lot, uh, a lot more profit. Um, yeah, that's true. But civil rights laws say no, that's not something that we stand for. So education institutions are subject to a specific set of civil rights laws, and it's a trade-off. If you're going to run your commercial enterprise and for profit but also try to seek the advantages of being an educational institution, which is to say tax-exempt status, which is to say the goodwill that comes from being associated with education, and which is to say federal funding, which is the hook for Title IX's application in the first place, you've got to pay that penalty. You've got to pay that price. You can't have your cake and eat it too. So if you're paying male athletes because that's what the market will bear, um, Title IX says you've got to cough up equivalent proportionate dollars for women too, notwithstanding the fact that they wouldn't necessarily have that opportunity on the free market. You split that, in, you can split that pie in two pieces. I always say that big time college and professional sports is uh, private enterprise cleverly marketed as school and regional pride. <laughs> yeah. That's what I always yep. say. But you have the aspect of grant and aid scholarships 
room and board. We have that aspect of it. You talked about artificially depressing how much players are made. That's the Jeffrey Kessler lawsuit, Winston and Strawn. That's what they're doing right now. And then you also have the aspect of Ed O'Bannon's at, well, case in terms of name, image, and likeness. Now, this is Toyota paying X player amount of dollars to pay, to, to, uh, to, to just be like their sponsored athlete. This really doesn't have anything to do with the money that any particular school pays the athlete. This is a private institution that's separate from a school that pays a guy. Say he has a you know, Johnny football, the trade bar. I know he's not very good now, <laughs> but at a time he was pretty good. And he wanted to make money off of his name. He should have had the right to do that. That had nothing to do with the institution under which he played. Yeah, but that, that's mixing apples and oranges a little bit. So that, I believe, is going to happen. Athletes are going to be able to sell their likeness, endorse products, be in commercials. That's a totally different thing than paying them to play football. So if, mm -hmm. if we can get the NCAA to agree that athletes, I mean, look, if, if, if you're a violinist at NYU, you can play in the NYU Symphony and you can go, you can go play in the New York Philharmonic. And athletes should be able to do, do the that. same they thing. That, but we don't have to pay them, you know, we don't have to essentially pay a, the basketball player $100,000. I don't think we'll ever get there. I don't think, I really don't think we should get there. Because I don't see a third string, a third string quarterback at Notre Dame being more valuable than a heavyweight wrestler at Iowa. They may not ever be, though. Who wins the NCAA championship. Yeah. I mean, they, they both put their bodies really at risk. And I don't think you pay the third-string quarterback a lot of money to go to the school because it's football. Uh, I don't have a good question for you. Sorry, Jen. I think there's two issues here. Hi, Xavier. Hey there. <laughs> Thomas, didn't see you. Um, there's, there's two issues, though, right? One is the law, and one is what do we think should happen. And there may be a big gap there, right? I mean, yeah. if you follow the Jenkins case, right, as an antitrust lawyer, you may have a hard time trying to figure out the appropriate NCAA defense that's going to win that lawsuit. That doesn't mean that we want that scenario to open up. We have free markets. But the law might say, hey, here we are, right? And so I'm always sort of concerned in terms of let's not mix those two. They're very separate tracks. One is what do we want? And I think most people are sort of, okay, we, we know that the names Images and likenesses are sort of coming down the path. That's a hard one to block, thanks to the man to my left, right? He opened up the, the mindset between him and Taylor Branch and a couple of other pieces. We now have reached sort of this tipping point where we're at a law school talking about these issues yeah. when 20 years ago, you know, it would just be squashed and you'd never talk about it. But where do we want to go, I think, is sort of a, an interesting conversation about what's the right thing. And I think that's where you start getting into the role of unionization, yep. because that affords players, schools, everybody involved to come together and say, look, let's use the labor exemption and figure out ways to craft a system that benefits all of us, that retains that concept of players as students. Otherwise, that's going to be gone. Uh, but but the, the, the difference really is, you know, if, if an athlete makes a deal with Nike, Nike is paying the athlete. Yeah. That's different than the university paying the athlete to play. Absolutely. And I, and I just, you know, I don't think a Jenkins case has any chance in, in the world. And in the, in the O'Bannon case, you know, to some extent, because of what the Ninth Circuit did, it's going to hurt that, that, that road. It's going, to stop, it's going to stop a lot of this because the court said essentially that the Ninth Circuit said essentially that it was it was not an antitrust violation for the NCAA to make sure that universities and college don't make any payments to student athletes that are not tethered, which is such, a, such an odd word for a court to use, not tethered to academics. So uh, I, I think that's going to be a very tough hurdle for any future case to ever come. Well, let, let's say that the Ninth Circuit hadn't reversed on that point, and what, what Alan's referring to is that one of the two remedies ordered by Judge Wilkin in her injunction was this notion of member institutions having the option of placing up to $5,000 right, $5, a year 
in trust, um, which would be paid to athletes um, upon graduation, essentially. And this uh, money would be tied to the licensing of name, image, and license. I'm sorry, name, image, and likeness rights. Let's say that that had come to pass. We know that the O'Bannon case expressly dealt with um, football, bowl subdivision, football, and D1 basketball. Uh, Pro Professor Bazuvis, how would that have played out in terms of um, perhaps uh, female athletes playing uh, women's D1 basketball, or even uh, female athletes in a complete uh, nonprofit sport, so to speak? Yeah, well, I mean, it would have definitely charted some new Title IX waters because there's obviously not existing regulation that deals with something that you know has never happened, and certainly the Department of Education when it passed Title IX regulations back in 1975, could never have anticipated this. But what those regulations do for athletics um, is to set up a framework of, um, of separate but equal. Uh, that schools are permitted to have separate men's and women's athletic programs as long as there's equal treatment in the aggregate. Um, and applying that principle to new ways in which athletes are treated would lead me to the conclusion uh, that athletes who receive some kind of benefit, uh, you know, for, you know, through, uh, through these trust funds, that that would have to be handed out like any other benefit that an athlete receives, whether it be... But not uh, if it's from a third party. Well, but how is it from a third party if the school if is taking... If it's from Nike. But the trust funds would have been operated by but this two the separate. institutions. It's, that's two separate situations. I mean, I think you're right that third party payments are outside the scope of Title IX. But if you're talking about a universe where the, the institutions own the name, image, and likeness, and they are taking, selling them and taking money for them and taking that money and handing it out to athletes, that's no different than selling tickets at the door and using that money to fund your men's but not your women's team. You're saying like if, if Lowe's is the official NCAA partner for X amount of dollars that there's a percentage, like imagine a percentage now goes directly, you know, to players beyond just like. The yeah, institute. I great. mean, when Lowe's is making direct yeah. payments to players and it's not, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, and those kinds of things aren't in any way becoming part of the institution the you know a, a mechanism by which the institution can control the institution is truly saying our hands are out of this now you know there's gray area in between and i think that's you know and, and that could possibly be exploited um and used to end run some of my uh, clear positions about third party payments being outside of title nine i mean to what extent are uh, booster clubs for example you know i think that if a college booster club came along right now and said we're going to give a thousand dollars to each of the members of the uh of the men's football team <laughs> That'd be a major Not ever. Uh, Not ever. Yeah, but in a world in a world where Never. you know in a world where there were no such restrictions because we've you know moved past that and tried to liberalize, liberalize these rules, um, that even though that is a booster club, you could you're going to say that's third party payment, um, but the but I think you know, the question is going to be as a matter of fact that there's a level of control there um, that I would in my mind, make a strong case for that coming under Title IX in ways that are different if it's truly a separate entity that the school is not coordinating with, not affiliating with, not saying, if you take care of these payments, then that means we don't have to pay for our athletes' uh, you know, meal plans and travel costs and other things that are actually part of the athlete experience. As long as it's not like structured like that, I think those third-party payments can be off to the side. Well, that's easy for booster clubs to just do to move outside of the scope of a school and do that <laughs> it's not very hard no this is the, this is the reality that we already are in so, i was yeah. i'm glad to see the panel being practical so but, it's, <laughs> but, again, but again it's what they're it's what they would be paying for you know i think when a booster club like you in, mean like the benefit that the booster yeah. club would be if receiving the if the booster club is paying for something that is integral to the athlete experience the school still has the obligation to provide that commensurate, like that commensurate experience, uh, perk, whatever that may be, uh, to to female athletes. Um, do they have to pay in cash like the like the booster club? <laughs> <laughs> That's a joke. <laughs> fair, fair enough. Mr. Milstein had referenced the portion of Judge Wilkins' decision that the Ninth Circuit reversed. I want to talk before moving on to unionization about the significant portion of the, of the uh, decision by Judge Wilkin that the Ninth Circuit affirmed. 
which is, and, and I rewatched the oral argument in the O'Bannon case a few days ago, and I was struck by how vigorously the NCAA opposed uh, the, first, um, the first remedy that Judge Wilkin fashioned, which was this notion of um, the NCAA being enjoined <coughs> under Section 4 of the Sherman Act from enforcing any rule prohibiting schools from topping up grants and aid to full cost of attendance scholarship. And of course, the difference is that a uh, cost of attendance scholarship might cover something in excess of tuition and fees and room and board, and perhaps prevent these situations in which athletes perform exceptionally well in a Final Four game and then talk to reporters about being hungry. Alan, you spoke in my class a few minutes ago uh, before this panel started about Maurice Claret's situation and some of the facts that gave rise to Maurice's claim. Um, in particular, uh, part of the factual fabric of that case was Maurice wanting to travel home prior to the championship game to attend the funeral of a right. fallen childhood friend. Do you think that if those funds had been available that, that history might have, may have turned out differently? It might have, but you know, I have a much more basic uh, story. You know, I represented an athlete who had a tremendous career at uh, playing basketball at Temple, and he was named the Philadelphia Player of the Year. And there was a, the, the, the banquet he was invited to. He didn't have a sport coat. He grew up dirt poor, didn't have a sport coat, and so we wanted to buy him a sport coat so he could be pre presentable at the, at the conference. The NCAA said, no, you can't do that. Now, you know, would that even be part of this, you know? Arguably, it wouldn't, even if the I don't Ninth think Circuit would. had a yeah, I don't think clothes, you know, right. I don't think a sport coat would be right. part of it. You know, but that's really the inequity that you have. I mean, it's not, an, it's not an even playing field. You have a lot of kids playing college athletics who come from nothing. nothing. And they are on campus with kids who come from something. And yet they, they can't enjoy anything other than, at least legally, the, the books and the, and the classes. Who's seen the U, the 30 for 30 film? One day I'm going to get a computer, run across the security guy at Best Buy. Big, huge guy. We get to talking. Turns up he was a second string offensive lineman at the U. Played on those teams with The Rock and the uh, more a uh, set uh, Warren Sapp, all these other guys. He talked about during that time he was there, guys would be in the same apartment, eight, nine guys staying in the same apartment so that they could save up money to send money home to their mom, to a poor relative. That's the reality that guys are living with. So, Luke, do you want to make a start? <laughs> Let, let, me, let me turn to Alan Milstein again in terms of how the O'Bannon decision might shape the future of the NCAA. You seem to hold out little hope for uh, Attorney Kessler's <coughs> lawsuit on behalf of Martin Jenkins, but mm. how would you advise a potential claimant to proceed? Would you target the eligibility rules of the NFL and the NBA or, or target the NCAA? I would target the professional leagues. And why is that? I mean, I think, I think it's the professional leagues that who have those eligibility rules. Now, if you're talking about a case like the Vassar, like, uh, the Vassar case, where you're talking about eligibility from a player moving from one school to another, I think the NCAA, I think the O'Bannon case is going to help that case, and I think that case is going to succeed. Right, well, let, let me talk a little bit about the case that uh, Alan is referring to. This is a situation of learning from your students. A few days ago, one of my students brought to my attention and the panel's attention a brand new case filed just a few days ago on behalf of a football player um, named basketball player, basketball, yeah, player. basketball player named, named yeah. Johnny Vassar, and essentially his allegations, and these are just the allegations in the complaint, <laughs> is that the school had engaged in a quote shady, dirty, and underhanded pattern of behavior, unquote, in order to essentially confiscate the athletic scholarship of Johnny Vassar, so that scholarship slot could be used for another player, and and the university allegedly berated Mr. Vassar and allegedly attempted to trick him essentially into signing something called a roster deletion form and allegedly put him into an internship where he had to do work as a janitor and his friends were essentially making fun of him and then allegedly and again these are all the out just allegations in the complaint allegedly falsified time cards related to this uh, demeaning internship an internship that was demeaning in the first place and different from other internships that athletes received to make it appear that he had engaged in wrongdoing. And by virtue of this case, Mr. Vassar asserts 
that the uh, transfer rule violates Section 1 of the Sherman Antitrust Act in that it places, it represents a conspiracy and restraint of trade. And uh, but for this transfer rule, Mr. Vassar would have been able to escape these, I guess you can call them shenanigans, and transfer to a different institution. And of course, the NCAA's transfer rule generally provides that a transferring athlete has to sit out of competition for one year. And so again, the claims in the Vassar case are that that rule should be struck <coughs> down as in violation of Section 1 of the Sherman Act. I, I know you may have some strongly felt, uh, strongly felt opinions about this, Mr. Pope. Yes, I do. We have college coaches. Take Guys go to school to play for a college coach. We'll be collecting two paychecks at the same time because they leave to go to another institution. But as a player, you're, you're stuck at an institution if you, if you want to leave. And then you go to a certain place, you have to stick around. Uh, you have to stick around for a year and not actually play. Well, that, that only actually applies to the revenue sports as well, that it, rule. Yeah. Just I mean, so you know. Well, this right. is well, revenue. Baseball. This yeah. is what it's all about. Um, the major, I guess. Thing. Yeah. And what the issue the major sports. Yeah. Major, <laughs> major sport. It's, this is, the issue is you have coaches that are moving around. They're enjoying their lives. And the spirit of why the transfer rule exists is to is for fair competition between schools. You don't poach players from other institutions, but schools are poaching co coaches all the time. And conferences. And, co and conferences. So it, 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 there's a really duplicitous hypocrisy that go is going on. That's really inflames me, and that's why I have strong opinions about it, because it just doesn't, if the, the, the NCAA is not actually going along with the spirit of the rule they've set forth in terms of athletes. Well, not, it has not only. Thoughts. <laughs> uh, well, I just look. I, I agree a hundred percent, and it's it's uh, it's uh, it's it's weird. It's uh, hypocritical um, that you can, like you said, Xavier. If you if you trend, if if a, if a coach a coach can even stay in the same conference and not be uh, and get a pay raise, uh, and then a, and a, you know if a player transfers, they have to transfer. If I'm not mistake and have to transfer out of the conference uh, if they transfer into the same conference they have to sit out two years if I'm not mistaken Something, it, it you know, some, and if you transfer out into a different conference you got to sit out one year so I, I don't know but look the point is is that, you know the player has to sit you know has to sit out and the, and the coach uh, and in most cases gets a pay raise and that's that's pretty that's pretty crazy to me you well, hear, it, hear something else that's crazy about this case it's Northwestern University. <laughs> the NCAA has been in existence for 73 years. Northwestern University, this is a basketball player. Northwestern University has never made the NCAA tournament. Never. In 73 years, they've never made the playoffs. They are the, the all they are is failure. The, oh, wow. the coach, the coach of this inept program makes two million dollars a year they have won nothing they've just built a 200 million dollar facility to house this terrible inept basketball team uh, tell them how you really feel. so so it just tells you how much money is in this game exactly. even for terrible inept failing teams but, uh, but yeah. as terrible as they are that they are in a conference that is in a power five conference they have to compete and stay but they don't compete I, they're well, terrible but, <laughs> but but it's the it's the mantra if you build it they will come they, so i i'm they they build it, nobody I, has come they ain't i'm coming. in agreement they ain't I, coming and they ain't going i'm, I'm de <laughs> definitely i agree 100 percent. i think that there's always um, exceptions in, to every NCAA bylaw, and there's definitely exceptions to the transfer rule. I personally, with my you know institutional and compliance hat off, you know Danita Peoples as the person, I f definitely feel that it is the most uh, bitter um, approach of throwing a temper tantrum when a student athlete no longer wants to play at the institution. I think that. It's really sad on a, on a number of levels that you would be that bitter to not release them 
um, to go and, and be free and be at any institution that they want to be at. Any, any, no, hold on. One you know sec. what their defense is? But on the other Can side I, of that, the institutional on, you side. Are, you are, as a player, you are 100% at the mercy of your institution. If you want to appeal anything, you have to appeal it to the coach, to the school that you're leaving. It is total bullshit. When... Somebody really feel coaches, weird. coaches make promise. They can, you can promise anything when you're getting recruited. You get all these promises about playing time, all this stuff. We're gonna bah, hey, rah rah rah, and then you get there. They don't have to do any of that. You are on campus. They own you. And then when you want to leave, those people control your entire destiny. Yeah. If John Beeline said Luke Bonner is not going to UMass, I can't go to UMass. There's nothing I can do. And then he can go to Michigan and make his ten million dollars, whatever it is a year. It is total crap, and there needs to be. That's why there needs to be, you know, some way for it to protect the players on, on not just money. It's like a lot of really basic stuff like that. If if you had a union, would guys agree not to play if they left the school? No way they would. But Xavier said one thing that's wrong, which is, I mean, we the, we know we know that the reason for this is what you said because it would be, it would be essentially, perhaps an damage to the competitive aspect of the of the sport but the end that's not the NCAA's reason for the rule because if they said that was the reason it would be an antitrust violation the reason for the rule they say is because when an athlete moves from one school to another he should have a year to adapt, to adapt. and decompress right. but but it's no problem going from high school there's no right. adaptation needed to go from senior but high school to that's the reason for college. that's the basis that they say for the rule correct <laughs> <laughs> um also just in terms of the i guess the alleged uh, accusations in terms of the player and the treatment of the player from the coach i, I i'm not going to speak to that like case i don't i don't really know but but these things happen in a broad, I know a lot, like a lot of my best friends are players. There's a lot of crap that happens, you know, between coaches and players. And I mean, that's a reality of when, you know, even at America East schools, coaches are making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. It's a high, and, and everyone's trying to climb that ladder yep. and get to the top. So these coaches are making, you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars a year. They're under a lot of pressure too. And that's when stuff happens, um, you know, in terms of the mistreatment of players or some guys not performing as well as he should. You're going to find a way to get rid of them. Yeah. And I think that anyone on the panel and everyone in this audience can agree. Coaches are incentivized to leave and to go and to find the best job possible and move up in their career. No one's saying shock smart. You're at this, you're at VCU. You, hey, you know, be loyal to the school. Like, no, go to UT and make yeah, all the money you can. <laughs> Right, certainly coaches' salaries as well. Sorry. <laughs> certainly coaches' salaries were, were one of the um, arguments that uh, Judge Wilkin uh, raised in opposition to the NCAA's assertion that it was important not to pay players because competitive balance needed to be maintained. And certainly an observation in the case was, hold on a second, schools are free to provide first class and even world class training facilities if they wish. Schools are free to hire the very best coaches, which would, of course, give a competitive advantage. So I do think that this discussion is, is very much um, integral to the O'Bannon decision. Before we move on to unionization, and it's very, real quick, real quick, sure. Just real quick, um, I, I wanna say um, it, it doesn't always, I, I'm ex I've experienced uh, one way where uh, coming out of high school, I committed to UNLV and uh, uh, Coach Tark told me, don't sign a letter of intent because we might go on probation. Uh, and if we do go on probation, you'll be free to leave. I don't want you to stay. I don't want you to uh, suffer what we are going to go through uh, as a basketball program. So he didn't let me sign a letter of intent. They went on probation, and I went, ended up going to UCLA. So it, every now, every blue moon, you're out run, there. run into a good, a good guy. Kind of ironic sure. that the NCAA demonized Tark pretty bad. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. No, I think that's a, that's a great counterexample, and it's important, certainly important to, to hear those in the interest of, of fairness. I, I agree completely. One last question on the O'Bannon case before I, I want to move on to unionization, especially considering that we have Mr. Bonniger. I want to ask Mr. Milstein as a, an expert litigator, certainly one of the finest, as I've seen in multiple cases, one of the finest trial attorneys in the country. 
One of the things that I've observed in, in studying this area of the law is that trial courts seem to find athletes' causes especially persuasive. In the Claret case, despite the reversal uh, by the Second Circuit, Judge Shinlin found Maurice Claret's arguments extremely persuasive and agreed, agreed essentially with all of them. In the O'Bannon case, Judge Wilkin um, authored a very strongly worded opinion, agreeing essentially in total with uh, many of Mr. O'Bannon's arguments. In the Oliver case that I mentioned earlier, the trial court in Ohio, in Northwestern, the regional director um, agreed with virtually every word of the evidence that uh, Kappa had put on. Even the so-called deflategate litigation featured a situation in which the trial judge um, felt very strongly about a particular athlete's rights and the uh, circuit court reversed. What do you think it is about these cases that make them especially palatable to trial judges and fact finders? Yeah, that, that's an interesting question. You know, I also teach bioethics and, and have bioethics cases. And the same is true in those cases. And, it, you know, when you have a judge in a bioethics case with a person who's essentially the life is on the line, let's say it's a Jehovah's Witness who the issue is whether or not to give a blood transfusion, where the law says it's an adult, you can't force the blood transfusion, many, many times the, the trial judge will say, I'm going to side on the side of life and, and order the transfusion. I mean, with bioethics, my view is, you know, I personally would, would like to get rid of the appellate process. I like trial lawyers. I like what trial lawyers do. Uh, I'd be curious to know what Michael thinks of, of with a deflate gate. I mean, did we need the second? Did we need the second Take circuit? Course. Don't get Mike started on the plate. <laughs> did we? Did we need the? You know, did all you know? Road, and and Mike and I were at that, <laughs> Mike and I were at that. We're at the uh, argument, and the second circuit didn't understand the case at all, and they didn't understand football at all. I mean. Wouldn't we be better off without the appellate courts, Mike? I think in that case, certainly, where <laughs> one of the judges thought that the NFL science was you know, essentially beyond a reasonable doubt when there were conflicting studies by neutral scientists. In fact, I don't think there's been one study, one, corroborating the NFL scientific conclusions where there's a host of studies saying just the opposite. So in that context, I think the rules about what's admissible in an appellate hearing or certainly played a big role in the Deflategate case. And I, I agree, it didn't seem as if the judges in that case really focused on the elements that I think were central to Deflategate. Now, I know technically their position was, we need to figure out if the collective bargaining agreement empowered this particular result and we're gonna give high deference. But I, I think it's a fair question to ask, was high deference unlimited deference? And if it's unlimited deference, then why even have an appellate check? So yeah, I mean, it certainly raises questions. And the Republicans, you know, they said they don't care if there's eight Supreme Court, they don't, they, they don't care if there's eight Supreme Court justices or six or four. Or, let's get rid of this. Get rid of the Supreme Court. Let's get rid of the, the appellate courts, and we'll just we trial lawyers will just try cases and either win or lose. What do you say? I'm going to hold off on comment on Republicans and Democrats. I do not think we should get rid of the Supreme Court. Uh, I can say that. I think the Supreme Court has been a very hot important take check. alert. All right, hot take. Don't get rid of the Supreme Court. Hot take. Quote that is going to be all over Twitter. Do not get rid of the Supreme Court. Fair enough. So, cer oh. <laughs> Certainly, to put a very last point on this before moving on to unionization, it was fascinating to me as I reviewed the cases that in the deflate, like, the Deflategate litigation, the chief judge of the Second Circuit, that is to say, essentially the senior most judge, dissented <coughs> and would have affirmed. And in Mr. O'Bannon's case, the chief judge of the Ninth Circuit dissented and would have affirmed. And that was a very interesting connection that these senior most judges um, sided with, with the athletes. Perhaps we might say um, that that's interesting. So uh, moving on to unionization, we certainly want to talk with everybody about this, but Mr. Bonner, you know, we certainly want to hear about, you know, briefly as we're running towards the end of the session, but your efforts to unionize uh, collegiate athletes. Yeah, so it, it wasn't our first option, I guess. I had been, I had been introduced to Ramogi Huma in about 2006 uh, when I was still at UMass, and I, I, I got like a, like a mass email, and I actually replied to it. I was probably like the only person. And I ended up uh, doing a bunch of research and stuff for him on uh, all sorts of different cost of attendance gaps and everything like that. 
And at that time, I felt like I felt like I was a like like a covert agent in like my athletic department. Like I couldn't have anyone know in the athletic department that I was like looking into this. I was so scared, like I was gonna lose my scholarship or something. I think the atmosphere has changed since then. We tried all sorts of different stuff, little protests, things like that, that didn't really do much. And basically, like unionization was the last resort. I guess it was like, all right, we're gonna do something or not. And um, Ramogi called me. Um, I'm going to get my years mixed up. Don't quote me on this, but 2011. Um, and at this point, I had been overseas playing in Eastern Europe and was transitioning into, you know, a career. And he, he mentioned that Kane Coulter was, what Kane Coulter was willing to do, the quarterback for Northwestern. And uh, he asked if I'd be, a, like, a founding member of uh, CAPA, College Athletes Players Association, try to file a union card for Northwestern football. Um, and I'm going to be honest with you, my initial, re my initial response was no. Like, I'm not going to do this. And, and I kind of realized, like, as soon as I hung up, that's how the system works, is that you're in, you're out, and then you just have your own life, and you just don't care anymore. And, you know, I talked to my family, because uh, you're, you're very public in doing this, too. Obviously, it's, like, historic. Like, oh, they're going to try to unionize. Um, and everyone was very supportive, so I called Ramogi back and decided to, uh, to get on board. But essentially what we were saying is um, that – your job on campus is to play your sport. So if you're a Kane Coulter and you play football for Northwestern, that's your job. That's like that's your main reason for being there. You are an athlete. Um, you, your compensation is your you know room board, whatever, all that stuff. And as such, you know you're protected. You have certain protections afforded to any uh, employ, full time employee um, at a at a private institution. And so we kicked ass on you know the NLRB regional court they you know, like you said agreed with everything um, but then in, on the national scale um, they decided not to exercise jurisdiction so it's not all the articles will say like they lost or whatever but it's just like it's kind of a big thing to decide on and they just decided not to exercise that jurisdiction um, but in the the general counsel report they reiterated the fact that uh, and they used the term employee and referred to Kane as an employee. So that, that's pretty historic. Um, and so that's kind of like, I guess, a little bit of a background in uh, the movement we were trying to go towards and, you know, to get, again, a lot of, everyone's going to jump to pay for play, pay for play. But there's a lot of other things, you know, that are involved with, you know, if we were to have a union, that dreaded word, um, you know, in terms of, you know, safe working environment and guaranteed medical coverage, uh, you know, proper, uh, you know, concussion protocol, all that stuff. Um, but of course, everyone's going to jump straight to pay for play. And I don't know why, but people really hate the idea of young athletes getting paid. I don't know why. Well, you know, at the outset of today's uh, <laughs> session, Professor Roberts had mentioned how she was essentially gushing, if I'm using the right word, at, at being, in, you know, here to uh, hear what Ed O'Bannon has to say about this litigation, the notion of hearing from somebody involved in an actual, you know, in an actual case that we study. This is sort of, you know, this moment for me, because when I taught amateur sports law for the first time, I had a question for you. And I, I get to ask it now, which is, given the NCAA's limits in terms of compensation, both monetary and non-monetary, what could in, what could individuals, if they did unionize, hope to gain from a member institution? It's not like if if uh, I know LSU is a public institution, and so different laws would apply, but if the LSU football team unionized, um, it's not like uh, they could bargain for tremendous pay on account of Leonard Fournette's talents. Yeah, I mean, th there are certain things that are allowed within NCAA rules that are not mandated. So there's there's just like you could you could bargain for guaranteed four year scholarship or five year scholarships. Okay. Um, you could bargain for guaranteed medical coverage and whatever the best. Like you still have to operate within. NCAA rules. Well, do you though? If you get enough uh, unions, but, uh, then, right. then you bargain. Well, you bar well you you say we're right. not going to play unless you, as the yeah, yeah, member yeah, institutions right. to this organization, don't blame the NCAA. You are the NCAA. Right. We want what right. we want. We're not going to play if you don't get it for right. us. But well, I, it's that simple. Also. I think what, like even, even what that you is that simple. It is really that simple. I, University of Missouri, they fought to change right. something in their administration. Right. Yeah. They said, yeah. we're not yeah. going to play. Right. So it's, it's not unprecedented. 
if you have to look at yourself as a human being and say, what's right for me as a person? And Ed talked about this, and he said that there'll be, there'll be a player that will galvanize his teammates, and then there will be a change. Same thing works in terms of rights and responsibilities that schools owe to players in terms of unionization. It's that simple. And, and you see that the NCAA did respond just from the threat of this by they, they like adapted their rules and there's concessions made to players. I think that's actually when they introduced the, the sack vote. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> that didn't get you said to do this. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and I mean, just historically, that's the only way the NCAA changes is through intense legal pressure. Um, but I think one important thing to, to know here is like, I'm, I'm a founder of Kappa. I live down the street in Concord, New Hampshire, and I work at a marketing agency and I have a family and I'm just like doing this on the side. And it's like Ramogi's dedicated to it, Kane's in for the fight and all that stuff. But ultimately, we're going up against the NCAA and you know, we have help from other people who have different lawsuits going on. But they have like full time lobbyists and like like it's it's an insane battle and that's that's like like don't underestimate the just the power structure that like you're tr we're trying to disrupt and how you know hard it is I guess it's challenging yeah. right. and Mr. Milstein this is actually a serious question um, putting aside any political views that you might have we know that the NLRB members essentially serve at the pleasure could we know that the NLRB declined to exercise jurisdiction in the Northwestern case. Do you see that changing under a President Trump? <laughs> no, no. And, and let me just say, I'm glad Ed O'Bannon's here and not Steve Bannon. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, the people have been mixing the two of you up on Twitter, as I'm sure you know. <laughs> May I ask a question for for, uh, for Luke? Um, when you and Ramogi sort of started out on this effort, it's clear sort of the the role that Kane and Northwestern played, but. What was your vision for unionization? Because what always sort of interests me is, who's that bargaining unit? Is it a single team? Is it revenue producing sport, full scholarship? Is it all the men's football players in a conference? Like there's a, a slew of permutations there, mm -hmm. which then has a huge impact on what the outcome is. Because I think, you know, I mean, at least a lot of people, at least in this small sample size in this room, okay, unionization would be a great way to exert some <laughs> pressure to generate some sort of rights for college athletes. But the question is, what's the right bargaining unit from, in your mind to accomplish what you're after, or what we're all after? I think that's a great question. Mm -hmm. um, and great question. that's something I, I mean, honestly, like me, I, I'm not exactly clear on uh, yet, but that's, I don't, I don't see that as like a reason to stop, kind of just like, like going forward and starting with, you know, football, men's football and, and you know, bargaining, bargaining with Northwestern University as the employer. Um, and theoretically, whatever happens there, all of the schools in the, the Big Ten and really nationally to stay competitive, well, my, my theory is, was that they would kind of follow suit. Only, only, only issue with that is you, Northwestern is a private institution right. and no, the NLRB does not apply to public institutions. Then you have right, right. many of the SEC saying, I'm just schools saying in terms and of Big any Ten concessions schools. Okay. They gain, yeah, could, could spread. You are know. Gonna, yeah. Yeah, could you have I mean, like, like Michigan and Ohio, you can't collectively bargain right. exactly so that the, those are the right to work states you have you know so it, it could you could have one result in alabama or michigan and a completely different result at stanford right. so yeah now, warren do you think i mean do you think the girl the the women's field yeah. hockey team could be in the same union as the men's football team well i mean they they have such conflicts could they history. sure i mean a lot of what we're talking about is five-year scholarship and a voice at the table yeah. Right. I mean, it's that's that's bigger than can we pay another fifty thousand dollars to the left tackle who gets recruited to play at Alabama? Right? right. I mean, ultimately, and and think about the other thing that I think people forget about is how far we've come based on again Ed O'Bannon's vision and efforts and, and others. Right. I mean, we now have the opportunity for five year or four year scholarships. They were one year renewables. Yep. Like now, when when a men's basketball player at the University of Louisville breaks his leg on the Final Four stage. There's at least a conversation about, well, wait a minute. Louisville doesn't have to pay for his medical? That's a problem. Let's talk about that. So I think that, yeah, absolutely, I think that field hockey could be involved in this, depending upon how you're framing the conversation. Uh, Ed talked about Kurt Flood, Mike and uh, Ed, and he, Kurt did win his case, but he started the ball rolling. And things happen after that. 
So just the pressure itself, just like Luke just mentioned, that legal pressure, still gets the ball rolling in terms of what steps could be taken. And just that threat, NCAA, they have to look forward, NCAA and member, member institutions, and say, okay, what do we, or conferences, what do we must do in order to make sure that we don't catch the, other, the wrong side of history in the future? So. I, I definitely think that the student athlete of today, especially millennials, are much more, I don't want to say sophisticated, but they're more knowledgeable about um, what their worth is. Mm. And so these cases are definitely, you know, ripple effects and and osmosis. Things are going to start having to change. Do I think it's going to be, you know, there's, if, if you have 109 football players on a roster, you know, 35 of them are just practice players. You know, they're not going to see the field. They're not the people putting people in seats. So what does what does that look for, look like for a, a union, your union? The scout team's important. No, saying. I'm not, like, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. But I'm, ju- I'm just saying, like, the, like, I just, it's gonna be a Pandora's box. I think it's, it's gonna, the motion is definitely there, but there's a lot of underlying issues that have to be resolved. Very, very fair. I certainly, I know we're running short on time, but I do wanna get to a few, uh, a few questions from the audience that have been passed up to me um, and they're, they're all sort of of equal merit, and I wish I could have sort of 20 incredible questions, but, but one that I uh, think Ms. Peoples might be able to address is, uh, and I know that this questioner isn't necessarily referring to UNH by any means, but the questioner wants to know, how do we account for the fact that in some places the educational emphasis for student athletes is downplayed, uh, especially if they're perhaps waiting out or biding their time at a, uh, after high school at a, at a uh, member institution? What is the value of, uh, of the degree? Well, I, I'd have to ask that question, that person, what exactly they meant by undervalued. Obviously, when you think of the Dukes and the Cows, um, these are both prestigious academic institutions as well as dominant um, athletic institutions, and their degree holds a lot of weight. Um, so I'm not exactly sure. Yes, the mantra in a lot of athletic departments and teams you'll go by a locker room and it'll say clock in you're going to work like that that's a mantra right you want your athletes to eat breathe and sleep their sport to be um, especially elite athletes so I I definitely think there's a fine line um, when we're talking about the SECs um, of the world and when I say SEC I'm specifically talking about football and a couple of their basketball programs within that conference that yes they're there to play their sport but you see that at the mid-major level as well and i think that that is a, a mind frame that is inherent in and in athletes and in, in, in general depending on who you, who you talk to they're there to play their sport they just so happen to be you know a student i also think that college the university system is a place for you to become a professional no matter what that is so when I was at RPI and one of the hockey players decided to drop out of college to um, start an app nobody batted an eye like he's going professional in whatever he's doing and I think that that's true for for college athletes who are there to get on the bigger stage and that is professional athletics and it, I just think it's a it's a tricky line I think your your educational experience as a college athlete though is definitely compromised. It's not the same. There's you're not going studying abroad. You're not working internships. You're not doing any of that stuff. Well, there's stuff. proposals out and there that would help that. And you're in isolation. You're in isolation for sure. Like I don't. I'm not to speak anecdotally or whatever. But like when I played, everyone I know that played, they lived with the basketball players, mm-hmm. and you were with the basketball players all the time. It is not this. You're not the same as everyone else. When I was at West Virginia and we got upset by Marshall and students are driving by spitting at us, you're not a normal student. That doesn't happen to the field hockey team. You know, like, it just doesn't. And so um, I think your, your, your educational experience, that degree from Stanford, from Duke, it doesn't mean the same um, to about, I, I, really, I really believe this. My sister went to Stanford. Like, a lot of her teammates had a really hard time getting jobs out of college because they had no, like, relevant experience. And, and, you're, and you're funneled into certain... Um, majors based on your, your class schedule needs to fit yeah. your, your sports schedule. But it wasn't, oh, I'm sorry, Miss People. But that's the, that's the part of the, I'd want to ask the person, whoever asked the question, what exactly, you know, you meant by the value of the education. I 100%, you know, agree with you 
um, to a certain extent, athletes are athletes, right? You go to some institutions, their dorms are just for athletes. Their training facilities are right by their dorms. The dining hall for athletes are, are there. So, and yes, there are institutions who will highly suggest certain majors depending on schedules, right? Training schedules. So, um, but there are proposals out right now to, to, to accommodate for those voices of student athletes that want to study abroad, that want to have internships where the time constraints are not there. So the, the student athletes experience as a whole is, is something the NCAA, all member institutions are definitely taking serious. I, unfortunately, you know, I'm sure you'd say, you know, the baby steps to getting there, you know, the time getting there is a little bit slower than what you'd like, but it's definitely on everyone's mind. You also have certain institutions that there's a significant gap between the quality of education um, that the regular student population or graduation rates like UConn or, you know, or University of Cincinnati or any place that Bobby Huggins ever coached. Um, <laughs> So that's the issue. That's the rub. But what do you mean by that? Because some <laughs> some student athletes they have private tutors. They have you know the for African American studies at, at UNC who are writing their papers. For oh, okay. I'll, I'll answer. I'll answer that question for Bobby Huggins. Not a single person who played basketball under him at University of Cincinnati got his degree. Yep. The so graduation that's, that's the rates for African American basketball players are up. The the, the percentage came out. To, just to let you guys know. Oh, no, no, and, and some schools do a great job. But, yeah. but the schools that don't, where that gap is there, that's unacceptable, unacceptable. because the, this, this promise by the NCAA is at least you're getting a free education. Well, at least fulfill that part of the bargain, and yeah. they're not at many places. Yeah, it's that simple. What do you, what? Just quick, uh, quick, Danita, you can maybe pick up on this. Ooh. UNH has historically had among the best graduation rates. In fact, for years, we were number one. So good work. Keep it up. It's, it's, it's reflective in the records. <laughs> well done, Mike. Oh, <laughs> shots fired. Shots fired. <laughs> this is an unfriendly panel, by the way. I'm coming back. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Yeah. It's a hostile individual. I think we got to. <laughs> well, we're, we're getting close to. Uh, clo in fact, we're actually a little past 6.30. Sorry, yeah, you're going to cut him. He's now cut from the intramural team. Oh. We just <laughs> <laughs> But Thank you, Ed. <laughs> certainly, certainly one of the one of the great tropes, and and really one of the very greatest tropes of amateurism panels recently, is to sort of close. And I know Professor McCann did it with his interview of, of Mr. O'Bannon, with what we think or hope the future of amateurism is going to be. So I'd like to each ask each of the panelists, perhaps starting uh, with Mr. Pope, and sort of going down the line as to what you think or hope amateurism is going to look like um, in the next, let's say, ten or twenty years. I think that in the next 10 or 20 years, amateurism should be real with itself, that it's just not bad for certain players. And recognize that, allow um, for them to unionize, to, to collectively bargain for their rights and responsibilities within their sport, um, to make them feel comfortable going to the member institutions. And if they are going to be at those institutions, properly educate them. And I think that I have a really, a uh, wild idea. I think that booster payments should be legal and they should be regulated by the NCAA, but that's my <laughs> personal opinion. Uh, and I think that once we start being on the up and up as to what's actually happening at member institutions, then we could see some transparency and some fairness on the big time college sports level. All right, I'll go. Uh, I, think that, I think that you're right, and I think that uh, the pressure that antitrust litigation and that labor law cases are putting on the NCAA are going to eventually come to bear. And I think it's going to be really costly and uncomfortable for NCAA member institutions, especially when you add in uh, the cost of Title IX compliance that I talked about earlier. So I think that that's going to create an untenable situation where universities can't afford to be that hybrid of both commercial and educational interests because they have to pay both ways now. Um, and I think that that is going to create some decision time uh, and that some universities might handle that by going all in uh, with a commercial enterprise and divest from education, pay taxes like any other business, 
uh, not af be affiliated with the federal money that comes in through education. I think that other institutions are going to say, okay, we're not going to treat our athletes like employees. We're not going to give them a salary in the form of an athletic scholarship. We're going to give them financial aid. So if they feel like uh, they're not able to take a externship or go on a study abroad, or they feel like they're having to spend too much time on their sport, they can quit the sport and not lose their scholarship and not lose their ability to stay in school. Um, that would make, the, that would totally neutralize the argument that those athletes are employees. You don't have a labor law problem after that, uh, after that paradigm switch. Um, so, you know, maybe this twin pressure of um, labor law, antitrust, plus Title IX forces some universities to actually retreat into a true educational model of sport. So do you can become Division Three, or, <laughs> or just all Division Three? I'm calling, the bluff. I'm calling the bluff on all Was that yeah. what you yeah. uh, <laughs> I love Division Three. <laughs> hey, I love Division Three. Hey, I love Division Three, <laughs> too. I love them, too, but is that what you mean? Like, Viewers uh, don't. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 you, if, but if everybody, if, you know, if the, you're going to have, I don't know what you're going to have, your Power Five, or, you know, the schools for which, that's just not in their nature, and that's not what they're economically, fee uh, that's not what, you know, they've got other options. Um, but if, ev if, if your big name schools are doing a Division Three model, that doesn't look like Division Three anymore. Yeah. Like that's the, you still have, you still have levels, it's just, you've shifted into a. The Let's Division Three model? <laughs> 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 is this oh, a hot style yeah. thing? I know, well I do. <laughs> Keep it it 100. <laughs> He's at the end of the table for a reason. <laughs> this is a game of thrones up here. <laughs> uh, I, I'm, I'm not as optimistic as Xavier. I don't think we're going to see much of a change at all. There's so much money that the institutions, the coaches, the uh, athletic directors, the schools, the conferences are making and they're going to, you know, it's, it's the Soviet Union without uh, Gorbachev at the head. You know, you still have, you still have Khrushchev, and you're going to have Putin, and you're going to skip Gorbachev. So they are going to continue to perpetuate their own interest, and I don't think we're going to see a change at, at all in, in the way amateurs are treated. We athletes are treated. So the change so NCAA are the commies. <laughs> no, no, no it's, it's, I, I'm, not, I'm not equating them to socialism. I'm equating them to a but, dictator, but the football players an autocratic dictatorship. You're up. I think I'm slightly um, more optimistic than Xavier. And, um, a I'm optimistic. Uh, okay. Um, I think that with the proposals that are on the table now and every year um, pass and, and coming forward, we're moving in a, in a more uh, deregulated um, environment within the NCAA. So I definitely um, see that the, the student athletes' total well being and experience is definitely at the forefront. I, I would hope to see that student, student athletes will be able to own their own um, image and likeness and do whatever they see fit. There's Instagram models getting paid apparently on Instagram and YouTube and, and using their, their image and likeness to do so. So I, I, would, I would love to see that happen. I think that we're, we're heading towards that. I see that the, the transfer regulations are going to get a little bit more deregulated. We, we start at the graduate level and it'll trickle down to the undergraduate level as well. I don't think that student athletes should be considered, um, you know, should be, someone said they should get a salary. I, I don't think that salaries are going to be in the future of NCAA for um, amateur athletes, which is what they're going to strive to keep them classified as. But the ability to um, use their likeness and, and generate revenue for their, for their personal is something separate, and I think that not anytime soon, perhaps, but eventually we're going to get there. I did not know that IG models would be mentioned on this panel at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my take on amateurism is that it will still exist because the NCAA is, are the people in charge of defining what 
amateurism is. Um, you know, today, if your team makes the national championship for college football, you're now allowed to pay for the parents of the players to go to the games. If the University of Florida did that when my parents, uh, you know, were, were working and stuff, uh, and if they paid for them to go to the Final Four in Indianapolis, uh, that would have been a violation. So I think that, that the term amateurism is propaganda, but it's still going to exist. Um, what I'd like to see is a legitimate uh, voice for the players, whatever that means. It's nice to hear that there's proposals on the table by the NCA and all that, <clears throat> but that means nothing to me because that can always be changed or revoked, and it's still there's still no real like there's still no real like uh, protections for the players or anyone representing their best interests. I do think it's going to go further uh, along though because uh, we're kind of entering. Like you mentioned, we're entering an age where players are more aware of these things than ever. Uh, media is more aware of all these issues than ever. And people are more sympathetic and apathetic than ever before to the, the plight, I'm going to say plight, of an athlete. Don't get it wrong, it's awesome being an athlete. It is, it's also hard, but, um, but there's just more, more apathy. Another thing to keep in mind is that as we move along, the future coaches are going to be my peers, you know, people who who were playing and who were around during the, you know, serious commercialization of college athletics and billion dollar, you know, TV deals and all that. And I'm friends with a lot of those guys who are, you know, climbing the ranks of coaching right now. And a lot of them are on the same side, like believe in players' rights and stuff. You can't do anything because they'll say their hands are tied. But I think you're going to see more and more, uh, more and more uh, sympathy for the, the athlete moving forward and ideally, um, a legitimate uh, voice uh, representing them. One final question from the audience before the Chardonnay gets warm. <laughs> uh, this is a, a pressing question. Uh, Mr. Milstein, why do you have such disdain for Northwestern basketball? <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing. <laughs> Look, after the Cubs won the World Series, the, the most futile record in Chicago, at Xavier must know, <laughs> is nice. the Northwestern basketball team. <laughs> They're terrible. The Cubs can win the World Series, Northwestern can be a competitive basketball team. Yeah, okay. you clearly, did you go to DePaul or something? No. no, 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 no. I want to say a couple of quick things. One is if you're interested in this topic, and you obviously are because you're here, Joe Nacera of the New York Times and Ben Strauss have a tremendous book called Indentured. It is on this topic, it's brand new. We've all read it up here. You should definitely check it out. And secondly, all of the students who have put this event together, could you all stand and we can recognize you? Look at that, great work, thank you. It's a testament to our students that you're able to put together an event of this quality to bring in a, a list of speakers of such high caliber we greatly appreciate all your great work. So that's all I have to say. I want to say thanks to Ed for the $2,000 check I got last year from the settlement. Oh, for the settlement? <laughs> <laughs> Did you get it? Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Did you declare it? Oh, yeah.